Thank you very much. I, I'm a native Tennessean. I was born there. During the age of segregation, when you couldn't go to the same amusement park or the same movie theater, when the white guys would cruise up and down the streets and call out to you, when the black boys were afraid of being lynched. But we went to church each Sunday, and we sang a precious song, and we found a way not to survive, anything can survive, but to thrive and believe and hope. I'm a native Tennessee, and I was born there, but I was only two months old when my mother and father moved my sister and me to Cincinnati during the age of segregation, when Dow Drug stores wouldn't serve us, when neighborhoods were redlined, but at least mommy could get a job teaching and daddy could get a job behind the desk, and after all, if you are a college graduate, that's the least you can expect. Though the Pullman porters took us south each summer and watched over us with an unfailing faith and got us from there to here. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. I was born there, in the only state in rebellion that didn't have to undergo reconstruction, in the volunteer state that sent as many for one side as another, in an area where if I just have to have a car break down, I would prefer any holler to any city neighborhood, but there was no work and no way, and the chronic angers that flared would chase us to Ohio. We were not lies across the river, just four people, two in love and two who were loved, who needed to put a rest to the rage. But the rage stayed and someone had to go. I chose me, but I was born there, so the going was a coming. I'm a native Tennessean. I take no joy in Davy Crockett nor Jim Bowie. They were wrong to be at the Alamo. They were wrong to fight for the theft. I love James Adji. I loved Thunder Road, though I, a native Tennessean, was not allowed to play a bit part when the crew came to town to film the movie. Ingrid Bergman and Anthony Quinn came to take a walk in the spring rain. And despite it all, I like Andrew Jackson. At least he knew the big guys were wrong. I'm a native Tennessean. I graduated Fisk University in Nashville. I know that the freedmen paid for that song. Nobody gave them anything. Pennies and nickels and prayer and determination. The freedmen paid for it and many others. I know the American Missionary Society took the money the Jubilee Singers made to save Fisk and used it for other purposes. I know the American Missionary Society was wrong. I was educated by the singers of those songs. I love those songs. How could I not love Nashville? How could I not love Dinah Shore, who invited the Jubilee Singers to sing at the Grand Ole Opry, then had to hear those rumors? She sang on, sang until she saw the USA in her Chevrolet. Mwah. I once saw her on a plane. I was going to the cabin. She was in first class. I said, hey. She smiled and said, hey, back. When I got Georgia on my mind, I rode the Chattanooga Choo Choo to Lookout Mountain. I saw Memphis and was enchanted, from the mighty Mississippi gracefully turning all red to Bell Street Beats at midnight. All those blues from so many bloods decided to turn my blues to Memphis gold. W.C. Handy, Bobby Blue Bland, B.B. King, the late, great Johnny Ace, stacks and stacks of music. American music. The Athens of the South held Tennessee music, but Memphis put the tears to the lonely and crossed over. Everybody wants to rock to my rhythm. I am Memphis. I heard the shots that took Martin. I know who killed the king. I'm a native Tennessean. I know what it is to be free. I am singing the country blues. I am whittling a wooden doll. I'm underground mining coal. I am running moonshine. I'm a white boy with a, with a banjo, native to West Africa. I'm a black boy with a twang, native to the hills. I am smart. I am cool. I am unafraid. I am free. Yeah, I'm a native Tennessean. <laughs> I, I really love that poem. I just couldn't be here uh, without. And I, of course, I am an, uh, a Fiskite, so it's always nice to be back home and, and, and to be in Nashville. And I'm looking forward to uh, coming back to Fisk, of course, for a spring uh, arts festival. So, yeah, that's going to be good because I'm on book tour now, and being on book tour is a whole nother kettle of fish. <laughs> As you, no, I like it, but you can hear I've lost my voice. I mean, you can, you know, ah, sound terrible. And, of course, I'm old, and so, you know, I don't know better than be running around the way I've been running around lately. But, uh, no, it started, and, and, you know, it's a book tour, so we can share a little bit of it. But it started because I have a student, his name is Kwame Alexander, and he's just the greatest kid. Thank you for knowing Kwame. He's just the greatest kid in the world, but he's not a kid anymore. Kwame's 46, and, <laughs> no, you know, you say, how the hell did that happen? You know, well, that makes me what I am, right? I'm 70, and so it's like, damn, you know? And... Kwame, <laughs> Thank you. But Kwame does literacy in Africa. He works with the LEAP program, L-E-A-P. And so Kwame called me, now it's been over a little bit over a year ago, because he's setting up this conference. And he said, Nick, you know, 
you know, Kwame actor, Yaki said, uh, you know, I'm having the conference in Accra, Ghana, and I need a speaker. And I said, Kwame, I'm so glad you called me because, you know, truly, I know everybody. What did you have in mind? I can, you know, I can be of some help. And he said, Nikki. I said, oh, you wanted me. <laughs> so, <laughs> which he did. So I had to go get yellow fever shot because I hadn't been African 30 years. But of course, if you get your shot now, if I, when I got my shot, it's like a booster shot. So I don't have to do that anymore. And then you get your hepatitis A and B. And you know, I mean, it's a lot of shots. But on the other hand, you don't want to catch anything. Like, you know, you go and you, you do that. But I went over and it was really, it was a lot of fun. And I, I met, met uh, Queen Juanita, who is just, to use a term that probably I can only use here in Tennessee, she's a hoot. She would, <laughs> no, people would tell, yeah, people tell you things like, you know, are you going to meet Queen Juanita? And, you know, she's the village mother. You know, they're going to this like what? I don't read. And so, it's, <laughs> no, people are, that's a constant. And I finally just said to some other people, let me, let me I said, slow it down. Let me, show, let me share a few things. Number one, I met Queen Elizabeth II because she asked to meet me. And she did. Otherwise, you know, you can see me calling Buckingham now. Hey. <laughs> And she did, and I looked good, and I was polite, and I was polite to Philip, you know, so I, I can handle it. <laughs> but more is what they needed to, to deal with. I knew Rosa Parks. I know how to cre treat queens. <laughs> so I don't have any problem, because I don't have any problem with that. But I absolutely fell in love with, 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 with Queen, Queen uh, Juanita. She was just, she was more fun. And being up country, you know, and the yams, you know how you see Scarlett O'Hare, which is such a lie. I'm so sick of the South and that lie. Uh, you know how you see Scarlett is holding up the, what is it, the cabbages or something? No, uh, uh, those other things, carrots. I swear I'm never going to be hungry again. Yes, bitch, you probably will be before it's all over. But mostly, you know, <laughs> you know that's true. But mostly, you know that what, Scarlet had, because even the Union soldiers, dumb as they might have been, but I don't think they were, recognized carrots. Who the hell doesn't know what a carrot looks like? What? I just thought I'd mention that. I hope there are no children in the room. It's just down on me. Maybe there's children in the room. But yams don't look like anything. So if you're white and you were a soldier and you saw the yams, it looks like big rocks. And you would not have destroyed them. So when we destroyed Atlanta, and we went out and got terror and got her home. What was left was what the slaves had planted, which were yams. And you know, yams looked like that. They just looked like big boulders. And I always wanted to see if you're going to do Gone with the Wind, which I'm not objecting to, you know, red and scarlet and all of that. But if you're going to do that, show me the yams. <laughs> Isn't that fair? I wrote a poem, and they got mad at me. I think I will read it, but I don't want you to get mad at me about it. I wrote a poem. <laughs> well, they asked me. I've never really, and that's the truth, I have never figured out why people ask people like me. I, I don't, because I, I wouldn't ask me to do diddly. <laughs> because I know that whatever, whatever I'm going to do is not going to be right, you know what I'm saying? But the Smithsonian was doing an exhibit because it's the 153rd, or 150th year. You know, it's a lot of things going on. It's the 150th, uh, do you call it an anniversary of the Civil War? And it's the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. It's the 50th anniversary, and these are just bad terms of, uh, of the assassination of uh, Kennedy. It's the 70th year that Marian Anderson stood at the uh, Lincoln Memorial and sang, can I share this? And I'm going to finish this story, but let me share this. I got invited because of that other thing to come and read a poem for Marian Anderson at the, at the Smithsonian, you know, on, on the steps. And it's like really cool. And so I was saying to my office, because my office is always like, I don't know if you can make it because, you know, we want to, we're clearing for Marion. And of course, not of course, but I do have a mink coat. And I have, and it's long because I'm a black woman and I want a big mink coat. <laughs> and, <laughs> so everybody was like, you know, aren't you going to be, might not be too warm in that coat? I said, don't you understand? that if it was August <laughs> in Washington, D.C., if I am on that memorial for Marian Anderson, I am wearing that coat. <laughs> oh, no, you have to. <laughs> 
But the Smithsonian is doing an exhibit, and it's right now, and it's a really nice exhibit, by the way, if you're, if you're up in D.C., and it's on the Civil War. And I wrote a poem. They wrote, they wrote a bunch of people. I think there were 14 of us. And they asked us to write a poem. And I thought, that's fun to do. You know, I, I, I'm a history major. I, I understand. I can do that. And I wrote a poem. It's called Note to the South, colon, You Lost. <laughs> Everybody seemed to forget, but they did. They were defeated. And so the healthy thing to do is to have a drink, cry, and get over it. So we go on. Of course, nobody liked that title, so people are now calling, Nikki, can we change the title? I'm a grown-up, so I know that you don't always get everything you want. So I said, you can change the title, leave the poem. So that's what we did, because I knew I had a book. It's a nice poem, too, by the way. I don't know why they didn't love it. Well, they liked it, they just didn't like the title. Note to the South, you lost. The buzz of flies almost was a lullaby rocking the dead to a peaceful place. You couldn't hear the ants, though they were clearly there, in the eyes, the mouths, any wounds or soft tissue. The worms had come, understanding those which were not trampled would have a great feast. The grasses had no choice but to drink down the blood and bits of flesh which were ground into them. In the future, it would be girls, not field rats, who would follow the soldiers to the trenches. In the, futures, there would, in the future, there would be single-engine airplanes dropping bombs. And then, in the scientific imagination of the 21st century, there would be men and women pushing buttons, making war clean and distant, but today, on this battlefield, the deadliest of this war, the songbirds had been frightened off. The turkey buzzards retreated to watch. Deer, skunk, raccoons, possums, groundhogs gathered to let the smoke clear. And only the moans of the almost dead and the quiet march of lice gave cadence to this sacrifice of, to this concert of sacrifice for freedom. But it's a sad poem, but it's a nice poem. It's a nice poem, isn't it? It's a good anti-war. People forget, and you know, sometimes when you see a war picture, the one thing you're supposed to say, I don't care which war it was. This happened to be civil war. But the first thing that you have to know is that the first sound is the sound of flies, because it's actually the flies that follow the blood, and you hear that, and that's the first thing. And if people had to deal with that, war wouldn't be fun, and people would get killing each other. That's another discussion. The book that we are here to, for today is called Chasing Utopia. And it's called Chasing Utopia, and I thought I, I started kind of backwards here. It's called Chasing Utopia because Utopia is a beer. You probably, most of you probably know that. Of course, Nashville has a, 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 a young beer scene going, and uh, I think that that's going to keep growing because you all are, Nashville's becoming quite a foodie town, and so beer is going to be a part of that. And of course, I live in Virginia. We don't, but no, our people in North Carolina do, so dogfish. Brewery, you know, does a lot of things with beer. I don't actually like beer, but that's another discussion. My, um, I don't. People have been giving me beers lately, so I'm becoming very popular with friends. But uh, <laughs> my mother was a beer drinker. And actually, Mommy drank a beer every, every day that I knew Mommy. So I don't know how old are you when you know your mother, 10? Maybe I can remember Mommy when I was around 10. Maybe I knew her at 8, but I don't. I just have this image of mommy always drinking a beer. As you know, for those of you who study things, beer is a liquid, so it's good for you. Uh, yeah. I don't do anything that's good for me. Beer is a liquid, and tea is a liquid. Coffee is not a liquid, and it's not. And uh, wine is not a liquid. Now, they may be liquefied, but that doesn't do anything for your body. You see what I'm saying? So mommy drank a beer every day, and my mother, unlike her two daughters, my older sister and myself, my mother did not have blood pressure issues. My mother did not have to wear glasses. My mother had all of her teeth, <laughs> you know, which is true of no, neither of her daughters. Both of us have issues. I take a pill every morning, you know. I'd be much better off probably drinking a beer, but I take a pill, and it's supposed to keep me alive, and I don't know, hell, I'm still here, but <laughs> I'm not really sure. We knew mommy was dying when she didn't want a beer. 
And I had been in Arizona, my sister called me, my sister had a brain tumor, and so we knew that Gary, her name was Gary, we knew that Gary was dying. And there was nothing that was going to change any of that. But Gary called me in Arizona and said, Mommy is dying. And I knew that Gary was, so I thought Gary got it confused in her mind. And I was like, mm, okay, but well, you know, I'm, I'm coming. But I was thinking that it's Gary who's dying and she doesn't have it in her mind about mommy. When I get home, when I, I got back, mommy's in the hospital, and I said, what happened? They said, she fell. Well, people fall all the time. That doesn't mean they're dying. But when we said to mommy, do you want a beer? And she said, no. I said, oh, mommy's dying. And it was one of the things. And oh, it was true. And she wanted to come home. She, she, she did. The body was shutting down. So we brought her home. And I sat actually here, and the, her, we had a hospital bed set there. And I wrote a book called Acolytes. And it's a book that I dealt with as I watched my mother die. I think there's probably nothing sad. I know there's nothing sadder for me than the death of my mother. But you have things to do when your mother dies. You know, and I went from being the baby in the family, just to kind of give you, you know, not that you all care, but I literally went from being the baby in the family because my, my sister died six weeks later. And so I went from being a sister and the baby to being an elder, and then my Aunt Anne died. And so all of a sudden, I'm one of the major, you know, and you have things to do. And so when you have things to do, you have to do them because you're not allowed I'm, you know, I'm an Amer I'm a black woman, and so you know that you're just not allowed to, to go off and be sad. You know, I do not understand drug addicts. <laughs> I don't, because they'll, they'll say crap like, you know, I had a hard time. Well, hell, how are drugs gonna help that? And then, you know what I'm saying? That is the dumbest crap you ever heard in your life, and, and you're saying your life is hard, and now you're gonna make somebody else's life hard. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, that is the craziest shit I've ever heard in my life. You know, get over it. So I'm now having, really, it makes me crazy. It's like people that commit suicide. Don't you hate people that commit suicide? <laughs> you, you really, you, you do. We, we birth you. I'm not just talking from the woman's point of view. Men have, probably have way more fun than women do. With. We end up, this thing is sticking out. Your back hurts. I don't care what anybody, your back hurts all the damn time. Your ankles are swelled. And all you're going to get after nine months or so is something that's little and undifferentiated. Right? And that's the truth. And your friends are going to tell you that it's pretty, but you know better. You look at this little red thing, and all it does is yap and want something to eat. Are you kidding? Then we wipe you off, clean you up, try to make you smell good, wipe your behind because you're pooing. All you're doing is eating and pooing. You finally get to be 16 or 17. One of your damn friends that don't even know you say something cruel to you, and then you commit suicide. What is wrong with you? We've been lying to you, telling you that you're smart and pretty and lovely. And you're not listening to us, right? We don't matter, you know. Oh, Billy said I was ugly and fat. I'm going to kill myself. And then the kid is dead. And there you have put 16 years. And what do you get out of it? I have a butt that needs wiping. No, you owe me. I, I think it's time we said that to kids. We keep giving these kids these passes. Oh, baby, you know, you're going to commit suicide. No, you cannot commit suicide. I will be 85 and I will need your help. <laughs> Hang in. I thought I'd mention that. Makes you crazy. But mommy, no, it just makes me crazy. But mommy is, is, <laughs> is going and I'm gonna have to do what I have to do and I really did. I, I pride myself actually on, on being a responsible human being. But when I got everything done that I needed to get done in order to bring everything, then I could mourn. And so I did what, I'm an American, I did what Americans do. I sat on my deck and started in the afternoon, probably about 11 o'clock or so, and had a little Chardonnay, and then about one o'clock I changed to red. <laughs> because I was incredibly sad, and I thought, I'm gonna mourn and I'm gonna be drunk. Well, I have a dog, and her name is Alex. And Alex is a nice dog, she really is a good dog, she's a little Yorkie. And finally, about two weeks after this, Alex finally gave me one of those, for you who are dog people, you know how the dog is looking at you like, again? <laughs> so I thought, well, I can't let my dog be embarrassed. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you can't do it to your dog. So I said to myself, Nikki, okay, you've mourned. You've been sad. Now get up and, and let's go. But I thought I should drink a, a beer for the old girl. You know, it's just, that's like, yeah, that's what I want to do. But I don't like beer. 
I, I never did. Uh, I cook with it, you know, and now, for those of you who cook with it, you know, pumpkin ale is out. And so you can put the pumpkin ale in your, your pig feet or you can put your pumpkin ale in your uh, uh, oxtail. You know, I mean, it, it's really lovely to cook with, but I don't want to drink it. And so I thought, okay, if I'm going to drink a beer for the old girl, I need to get a good beer. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't want Miller Lite or, you know, Bud or Slits or something that any old fool can drink. So I went to the bookstore and, you know, went and got the beer book. And I, I just wonder, what's the number one beer in the world? Well, it's Utopia. And I thought, okay, Utopia is number one beer. That's it. I'll, I'll call the beer store and get a Utopia. My beer guy is named Keith. So I called Keith. And that's because he's also the wine guy. So I, <laughs> it is. And I called Keith and I, you know, hey, it's Nikki, you know, I'd like to get a pint of Utopia, you know. And I know Utopia is going to be $350 a pint. I mean, I understood that, which is, yeah, it's not for everybody, but, <laughs> but it's not something you're going to do a lot of either, you know. So I called Keith and he says, you know, we never get it. You know, we're a small store, which is called Vintage Sellers. We're a small store, we never get Utopia. And there's a place, and this is FYI, there's a place in California, it's right outside Los Angeles, called Bounty Hunter. And they sell incredible wines, it's wonderful. And so I called Bounty Hunter because that, that's what they do, and I had a bounty that I wanted hunted. <laughs> and they know me, and I said, you know, it's, it's Giovanni, you know, in, in Virginia. And they said, how are you doing? They're fine, thanks. I said, I'm looking for a utopia. And you know how people get indignant? And it's like, that's a beer. <laughs> well, it's $350, I don't give a damn what it is. I mean. <laughs> It's business, you know, and it's like, no, you know, we don't sell beers. So, yeah, it's terrible. And so now I'm, I'm beginning to be like I am now on tour. I'm beginning to be on tour because, as you know, it's, it's February, so, you know, this is when colored people move all over the world. You, that's what we do. It's February. So one of the things that I got invited to speak at, which I, I was excited about, my office went crazy, but I got invited to speak to the uh, CIA. This is really funny. I'm an American. I pay taxes. I may as well speak. And, well, you know, otherwise you have to think. And then you start to discriminate because you don't like people and they don't like But I had nothing against it. And Leon Panetta is a f fun guy. So I go to speak at the CIA. And I'm saying, you know, because I know that they have the best computers in the world, and we all know that. And we all know that they know everything about everything. <laughs> so I'm at the place that everybody knows everything. And I said to Leon, you know, I wondered if you might do me a favor. I did a good job for him. I looked good. I had my St. John's on. <laughs> no, I looked good. You know what I'm saying? I, I was fine. I said, I wonder if you might do me a favor. And he says, what, little lady? You always know when they start that you're in trouble. I said, I'm, I'm looking for a utopia. And you know how men look at women like we stupid? And he does one of those, look deep within yourself. <laughs> So there's nothing to say about that. I was waiting for Leon to have something else to do, and he did, and I said to his assistant, you know, I'm, I said, I'm just, you know, asking, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a uh, utopia, and I wonder if you might help me. He says, you just have to think and work it through. Uh, and I'm like, doesn't anybody black work in this place? <laughs> you know, I, I obviously, I need a Negro. There's just times nothing else will do. And so I ran into one, and I said, I'm, I'm looking for a utopia. He said, oh, sure, come on, let me, let me find a safe computer, because they, you can't use all of them. So we went into a room. He had me turn my back and everything so that I don't see what he's doing, and he located it was in Canada. But I didn't want to buy Utopia in Canada. I want to buy Utopia in the United States. I didn't want to have to, because then you have to fill out who you are and why you, you know. And it was like, oh, Jesus. And so I was doing something that, in all fairness to myself and everybody, is called bitching. I, <laughs> I was, I'm going up the, the East Coast, and I'm just, you know, like, wow, I'm looking for utopia. I can't find it. Nobody yak, yak, yak. And God is good all the time. I get to Boston, and I'm complaining on NPR, and the guy, I am, <laughs> and the guy who brews, the, the brewmeister is listening in, and he calls into the station and says, tell, tell Dr. Giovanni we're sending her Utopia. <laughs> yeah, I was thrilled. And the four glasses to drink it out of. So I am thrilled. And I realize, you know how you're talking? Some of you write. I mean, we're here in Nashville. And so you realize there's a story. And I realize, oh, I need to write about this and how we got this. So that's how we came to the title of this book. Now, the fun thing, and, and 
this is kind of prosaic, what I did with Chasing Utopia, but it's, it's also kind of like poetic because I have a poetic voice. I mean, that's what I, that's what I do. I'm not gonna read it because it's long, but I did finally get my utopia. I am waiting on Queen Juanita to come because I was gonna drink it when the book came out, but I was on book tour when the book came out, and now she's gonna come to visit me. So I'm going, I, I've been trying to decide. I, I know I have to have, you know, like pig feet, but I was wondering. Well, thank you. I'm a black American. <laughs> and if I'm going to serve a $350 bottle of beer, I'm boiling pig feet. <laughs> it's so basic. <laughs> Absolutely. But the book is going to start from this point of me seeking utopia, or as it is, chasing utopia. It's called a hybrid, and that was an argument I lost to. I've been losing arguments a lot lately because I wanted it to be the hybrid, but my editor's name Rachel, and Rachel's a good editor, and she said, no, Nick, it can't be the hybrid. It has to be a hybrid, and I said, why does it have to be a hybrid? She said, because there are lots of other hybrids. I said, but none that chase utopia. On the other hand, you see, she won. I mentioned my father, and I want to read a poem, and it's a sad poem, and then it'll be the last sad poem I read, maybe. But um, I wanted to read this poem because my father, and, and, and fathers are strange uh, people in, in their own way. And one of the, I think, unattractive things they do because they don't realize the, I hope, that, I'm trying to work this one out. That, so I know that somewhere there's another book because I have a question in my head. And, I don't think my father was a bad man. I've written about him before, you know, to say all of while I was quite happy, and I think I was. On the other hand, I could tell you on any given Saturday night at 11 o'clock what I was doing. I was listening to them fight, only they didn't fight because she was too little to fight him, so I was listening to him hit her. And that's a very unhappy thing. And so I want to say to the fathers in the room, you got a problem with your wife, I'm sorry, but you know, you need a gym, or you need to learn to swim, or to go play golf, you need to do something but don't hit your wife. And it's not that your wife doesn't understand, because I think your wife does. She probably still likes you. It's that your daughter doesn't understand, and she thinks that you're out of your mind. It's true. And of course, your son grows up to be what you are, and that's a bad thing, which you know because you know already you're unhappy. You see what I'm saying? So I wrote a poem because my sister and I, the way the house was, our bedroom was here, their bedroom was there, and the dining room, living room, it was a small house. But I, you were always sitting there waiting for Saturday night. It made you crazy. So for Gary, her name was Gary. So for Gary and me, we were always trying to find a way away from it. So even though physically we we're at home, we had to find a way to migrate. Oh, am I making sense? Okay. Chocolate cookies, chocolate cakes, chocolate fudge, chocolate, chocolate lakes, chocolate kisses, chocolate hugs, two little chocolate girls in a chocolate rug. No one can find us, we're all alone, two little chocolate girls running from home. Chocolate chickies, chocolate bunnies, chocolate smiles from chocolate mommies. Chocolate rabbits, chocolate snakes, two little chocolate girls wide awake. What an adventure, my, what fun. Me and my sister still on the run, still on the run, still on the run. Me and my sister still on the run. We, uh, we cook a lot, and uh, well, we're foodies. And uh, I'm always amazed that I'm no fatter than I am. And I was out in Vegas. I don't know if any of you all are foolish enough to go to Vegas. <laughs> well, it's fun. Vegas is fun, and it's pretty. But the thing that you have to access when you go to Vegas is that those palaces didn't get built because people won. No. They got built because people lost. But the food in Vegas is now incredible because all of the foodies have, have migrated up. And there's a restaurant there called Guy Savoy. And I don't know if any of you have eaten at Guy Savoy, but Jesus Christ, if, if you only have one meal, <laughs> it should be Guy Savoy. So I wanna share, I wanna share a couple of, of uh, this, but this is artichoke soup, which is hard to make. You know why most people make really bad soups? Because they stint on the vegetables. Have you noticed that? I mean, if you get like a squash soup, they put like, a squash, <laughs> right? Four tablespoons of flour, you know, half a stick of margarine that they think you're gonna mistake for butter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then you're supposed to eat it. Well, that's not the way it goes. 
Guy Savour makes an artichoke soup that's incredible. Let me die <laughs> in a bowl of artichoke soup <laughs> <laughs> from Guy Savour, surrounded by garlic cloves and zucchini blossoms. Please wash me down with a 202 Ramy cab. I love the bread tray too, as long as a block. I'll have the lemon bread and the seaweed bread tucked under my arms. My smile will be enhanced by goat butter. My sauteed quail is floating in. I know, I know. I have to go one day, so please, let it be in pureed artichoke, no oil, no wine, just pure spring water artichoked soup. <laughs> I don't want you to think that I'm impatient either, and I'm not particularly impatient, but I have not, uh, haven't figured out exactly. I'm in the South and I recognize that too, but cooking grits is an art. And I know a lot of people think, you know, and, and again, I, I have the bad habit, my grandmother cooked incredible grits. And every morning, we knew that grandmother was dying the morning that she didn't wake up and cook grits, because she would go, grandmother had, we were from Knoxville, and so grandmother had an electric stove. You know, most people in Knoxville, I think still don't, because we had, the, when TVA came in, everybody got an electric stove. And so grandmother would get up and cook it. I could never fix my grandmother's grits. And I haven't figured it out. I, I, I think, psychologically speaking, I think I don't want to fix her grits because it would make me feel like she was really gone. So I think I enjoy messing them up so that I can say, damn, you know, grandmother should be here. But I wrote a poem for grandmother because grandmother's an incredible cook. My grandmother's grits are so much better than mine. Mine tend to be lumpy and a bit disoriented, though that is probably my fault. I always want to put one cup grits into four cups cold water with one teaspoon salt and start them all together. Grandmother did it the right way. She started with cold water that she brought to a boil, shifted the grits slowly into bubbles, then added her salt. She also hummed while she stirred with her wooden spoon. I wonder if I should learn to sing. <laughs> That's amazing. I fell in love and I'm gonna to totally recommend, you know, any of us that are in our mid 60s, going to 70s and beyond, if you haven't fallen in love late, do. Well, it's really good for you. First of all, it clears up your skin, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> it does. You start to look a little better and you start to say to yourself, hmm, I should go buy clothes. This is good for the economy. Because you, <laughs> no, it, it helps everybody. And you smile. See, the trick to love, everybody thinks that when you fall in love, somebody needs to fall in love with you, which is not necessarily true. What you need to do is to fall in love. If they're smart enough to fall in love with you, good. And if not, hell, you still get the benefit of being in love with them. <laughs> it's true. So it all kind of works out, and you kind of enjoy it. And sometimes it, it, it works out. But I'm not a fan of, uh, you know, vows and things. So uh, <laughs> I'm not. I know some people are, but, you know, hey, we're mammals. Get over it. So um, <laughs> I wrote a poem because <laughs> I shouldn't do that. My, well, my students are angry with me because we were having a discussion. And I was saying, you know, I think, you know, for people who want to get married, I think it works. I personally think, if I may, and I mean no disrespect to people who disagree. But see, I don't see the point in getting married with the gown and the tuxedo and the cake and usually the cheaper foods that they do because it costs a lot of money and I don't know who you know, but I grew up with the ladies in a beauty parlor. And the ladies in a beauty parlor handicap everything. And so John and Joanne are getting married. The ladies in the beauty parlor say, hmm, <laughs> it ain't gonna last <laughs> because they know John and Joanne, you see what I'm saying? So they give John and Joanne cheap gifts because they don't want to be in debt for something when the marriage is broken up. <laughs> they are absolutely right. I think what John and Joanne and everybody should do is just send out an announcement. John and Joanne are one. The ladies in the beauty parlor will then say, oh, ain't that nice, John and Joanne are one. Everybody's happy. Now when John and Joanne break up, we need the party. <laughs> it gives you something to do and keeps you from being angry. So as the couple is breaking up, 
they're coming together to plan their divorce party. They both want to look good because after all, they're now on the block again. The ladies in the beauty parlor, of course, feel that the divorce will last. So, well, they knew the marriage wasn't. So they now say, hmm, John ain't gonna be there, so we need to get Joanne a riding more. So three or four of them go together, go to Sears, get her a riding more. See what I'm saying? Because they don't mind being in debt, right? They know that, you know, nobody's there to cook for John. John's gonna need some help. So they go down to William Sonoma and they get him a lovely set of dishes so that he'll be able, you know, some pots and pans and things that he needs to be able to take care of himself. And of course, if he's smart, he'll cook for some other woman. She'll fall in love with him and he won't have that problem anymore. But this is the way it, it would work. My class got mad at me and they said, Nikki, you're cynical. I'm not cynical, I'm just realistic. <laughs> so that's my suggestion. Nobody listens to me, by the way. But I know I'm right. <laughs> and that keeps people from fighting. Instead of them arguing about things, and I hate you, and you know, you didn't do this, that, and the other, they're like, you know, hey, babe, you know, the marriage has taken its toll. It's, it's at the end. This has been wonderful. And we had the best divorce party of ever. Remember that? Uh, see, and you have something to celebrate. And then your friends don't have to choose who they going to side they're going to be on, because there's no side, because everybody's happy that we're breaking up. One of my students said, well, what if somebody's not happy? I said, when somebody said they're leaving you, there's nothing to do but be happy. Because <laughs> anything else is going to make you crazy, because they still leaving. <laughs> and that won't change. You see what I'm saying? And all of that, I kill you if you leave me. She's still gone. <laughs> but now you in jail, too. What kind of sense does that make? I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> it's just love. It won't sweeten your coffee or ice your tea. It won't grill your steak or bake your crusty bread, crusty bread. It certainly won't pour your olive oil over your shredded Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. It might make you laugh. It's just love. It won't rub your feet or your back. It won't tassel your hair or paint your fingernails red. It might make you want red fingernails, though. It's only love. It has no coupon value, though it also does not expire. Just me, just you, just love. Good for nothing love. Throw it away when you don't need it anymore. <laughs> That's fair enough. But uh, I mentioned cooking. I, I, I have to read this. This is my favorite poem in the book because uh, <laughs> It's obvious. <laughs> it's called Still Life with Apron. And if there are any children, you probably should cover their ears. <laughs> I would like to see you cooking. I would like for you to cook for me. I would like to see you decide upon a menu, go to the market and pick the fruit, the vegetables, the fish. I would like to see you smell the fish, test the flesh for firmness and freshness. I would like to watch you in the bakery, in the bakery by the dinner rolls, deciding rolls or crusty bread. I would like to watch you run back to get the goat butter. I would like to be sitting in a corner and you intent upon your meal, not noticing me when you go to the wine store. I would watch you wrestle with red or white. White, of course, because it's fish, but red is seductive. Whoever fell in love over a glass of white wine? <laughs> I, uncharacteristically on time, would like you to greet me in a butcher's apron. I would like to watch you greet me only in an apron. You would ask me to undress, to undress for you. Before I sit down at the beautiful table, before you hand me my glass, you would ask me to undress. I would like to watch you watch me undressing for you. I would like to watch the movement inside the apron as I undress for you. <laughs> I would like to watch you walk, no, stroll to your closet where you bring out your old buffalo plaid dressing gown, your pilly, much washed dressing gown that smells like you after you brush your teeth, after you shower, after you comb your hair. I would like to embrace your odor, your odor, your essence, as we sit down to eat. I would like for you to cook for me. I would like that very much. <laughs> Thank you. I like that a lot. I'd like to close. Um, on a poem uh, that actually is not uh, published, which is bad form, but um, I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And 
Ooh. <laughs> and speaking of the 100s, this is also the 100th anniversary of Delta Sigma Theta. And I think it's so easy to forget the great service that Delta Sigma Theta has done America, because when we joined the women's, and I'm saying we as a member, but when Delta joined the women's suffragette march, we made sure that the right to vote would extend to women as much as it does. I, I, I fail to understand why people are running around trying to keep people from voting. It seems the two things that people, that everybody in America needs is a voting card and a passport. It's just absolutely necessary, thank you. And it is. And you gotta have a passport, and especially those of us who are black, we have to have a passport because we never know when we might be able to go someplace. And if you wait, a oh, passport's only $100 or something, $120, something like that. That's not a lot of money, because you got 10 friends that have $10. <laughs> Christmas, no you do, Christmas is coming. And when people say, what do you want for Christmas? Say, a passport. Go get your passport. We go, we at Virginia Tech, we go to Africa, we go to Sri Lanka, we go to South America, we go places. And we can take you, but we can't ask you to go, and then you say, I don't have a passport, and then wait four weeks while you try to get one. Get your passport now. Everybody needs to vote. I don't know how we can call this a, a Democratic form, or a Republican form of government without giving the vote to everybody. Some people are stupid, we know that. And, uh, well you do. So there's no point in trying to say we don't want stupid people to vote because half the people that are voting couldn't vote if that was the case. <laughs> everybody has a right to vote and everybody has an obligation and responsibility. And I think things like that are important and the Deltas did that. We forget that Delta Sigma Theta of course was a part of Alpha Kappa Alpha. That they are our mothers, <laughs> that they are, <laughs> they're very, but they are, they're wonderful women. The, the AKAs, and again, rightfully so, this is truly not, for those of us who don't know, I, I have no quarrel with the AKAs because the, the, the suffragettes had said, finally, after we really pushed them, okay, you all, because you know, Miss Anthony was not a nice person. You all can, can march, but you have to march at the end. The AKA said, we don't want to march behind. If we can't be a part of the march, we're not going to do it. We have our pride, and I think rightfully so. The Deltas are the group that's going to become the Delta said, I think it's more important that we be there than where it is that we are. And that was very important. We forget that every president of the United States from Franklin Roosevelt on who has had a, a, a kitchen cabinet, they've all had kitchen cabinets, there's always been a Delta. We forget that when we look at what was called the Big Five, it was actually the Big Six. And 90% of the time, Dorothy Height, who was our former president, and a great woman, was cut out of the picture. And so you'd see Martin and all of them, but they'd have Dorothy standing on the end, and they, they pushed her out. We forget that all presidents turn to Deltas for advice. We know, and, and, and it's, it's incredibly important, that our incredibly brilliant soror, Lillian Bimbo, purchased a satellite in the sky, you can look up and see it. And somebody says, well, what y'all gonna do with it? It doesn't matter what we do with it, but when we figure out what it is, we have it. <laughs> no, that's important. Because as we go on, no, it's always better to have anything and not need it than to need it and not have it. And so we did that, and no, that's true. We know that the first family planning clinic in Baton Rouge, Louisiana was started by Delta Sigma Theta. But more, Beta Chapter in Knoxville, Tennessee was the first organization to do the March of Dimes. Because you remember a lot of people, a lot of rich people didn't like Roosevelt. And so when the Roosevelt Dime came out, they wouldn't take it. And so the, that's the truth. So the, the, the uh, Delta Sigma Theta at Knoxville College decided to have a march of dimes and collect all of the dimes. Well, white people that didn't even like us were going up the street throwing dimes at us. As you know, it's true. But as you know, the march of dimes was taken up by other people that they never said, thank you black people for giving us this idea. And they didn't and they should have, but there's a lot of things they should thank us for. But, we now know that the March of Dimes does other things, you know, but nobody wanted to thank us. And so I just wanted to put all of that in a poem as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the March of, of, of Delta Sigma Theta, because it's a very important what we did. Thank you, it's true. We marched. 
100 years ago into a sisterhood, we came together in love and patience, already called to assembly by our mother sorority. We needed to, had to, must break out. The suffragettes did not want us, offering only the back of the march. Our other did not understand us, so we went our separate ways. But the time had come. Black women could no longer wait. We marched. We marched for the vote. We marched against lynching. We marched about bombings and burnings. We marched for dimes, which the country took over without giving us credit for the idea. We marched for better housing, for the pig project in Mississippi. We founded the first family planning project in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which was burned down by bigots. We recognize you cannot be anti-abortion while supporting capital punishment. By what right must I birth him that you put him in the electric chair or prison for life for a crime he did not commit? We, sisters of Delta Sigma Theta, stood in the past. Dorothy Height was mentored by our great soror, Mary McLeod Bethune. Every president from FDR to LBJ had a Delta in his kitchen cabinet. Gene Noble famously boarded a New York train to put the power of Delta Sigma Theta with Daisy Bates and the Little Rock Nine. We stood for the future with Lillian Bimbo to own our satellite in the sky, to be the first black Greek letter organization to make a film with dignified images of us on screen. When there was a need for a voice, our beloved soror, Barbara Jordan, led the defense of the United States Constitution and therefore the impeachment of a president. We are great. Our sisterhood remains strong and committed. We go stronger on the love we share. We marched 100 years ago and we will march 100 years from now because we are Delta Sigma Theta. We stand for the good and the right.